Hi y'all, in this video I'm going to talk a little bit more about Brexit, whether or not the United Kingdom should remain in the EU. And the reason I'm going to do this is, be is because I've been watching debates in the United Kingdom and the United States seems to be on everyone's lips. Seeing as how I'm from the United States, I thought I'd weigh in. So on the Remain camp, uh, you'll be given a parade of horribles that will befall the United Kingdom if it leaves the EU, among which, other, among other economic calamities and and probably some new STD that'll kill everybody that they that they uh, pretend is going to happen is that you won't be able to cut good trade deals with the United with the United States. That if you leave the EU for some inexplicable reason, uh, you'll have no bargaining power, and the United States won't like you, and you won't get good trade deals with us. By the way, this whole we'll have to negotiate our own trade deals argument sounds a lot like a big complaint that Parliament will have to go. I don't know be parliamentarians and represent its the interests of its own country, uh, their own country, on the world stage. It sounds a little bit like a complaint that the parliamentarians will have to do a little bit, a little bit of work on important issues. And I'm like, that actually sounds pretty good. Make them earn their money. Anyway, so uh, not good trade deals with the United States. This is complete bullshit, and more importantly than it's being just complete bullshit, is that the people who are saying it are well-educated, and they have to know that it is complete bullshit. So I'm going to give you an idea of the love the United States has for the United Kingdom. It's the country, of, sorry, from our own, we like most in the world. The United Kingdom is that country. It's the one we're the closest with, we have uh, the most in common with, and that we like the best. Even when we're pissed off at you, which we do get pissed off at you from time to time, we, ha we are always there, hand out, to help you whenever you need it. And I, I realize that the ties go in the other, other direction, but this is about our attitude towards you, not yours towards uh, us. But in any event, you remember when they were doing the Greek bailout and this uh, 240 um, million euro bailout, and how it was so expensive and it's a big deal, about 170 pounds, uh, 170 billion pounds in, uh, well, in pounds is what that is. And that this this is a big thing. This is a lot of money for the entire EU, which is larger than the United States. Um, it, it just is uh, to to take on. That's a lot of debt. Well, the United Kingdom still owes the United States some money from World War One. How much money? Well, if you look at what we put in uh, to it at the time, we put it uh, pumped in about thirty billion dollars in World War One era dollars. This is on the backdrop of a federal budget that was less than a billion dollars per year. The federal, federal expenditures uh, were less than a billion dollars per year. And uh, we put in to uh, France and, and England about 30 billion, between 30 and 40 billion dollars. So uh, at the top end, if you think about it, in today's dollars, that's about a trillion dollars that we handed over to, uh, to, to Europeans in, in the First World War. Those loans are still outstanding. We've not been pressuring you for that money back. And what's owed today, um, if you look at it as a percent of GDP, would be about 225 billion pounds is what you, uh, the debt that you have remaining to us. That, once again, we're not pestering you to pay back. That is a lot more than 170 billion pounds that uh, was spent to help Greek. No, uh, it was in euros I converted it. Uh, to, to pounds. So about 55 additional billion pounds uh, more than what it, what the Greek bailout cost. In other words, I'm just saying that I'm not pointing, you know, we're a great country, we're, you know, all this in a bucket of fried chicken. I'm just pointing out, we're willing to give until it hurts for the United Kingdom. We really like your country. Now, in the interwar period between World War I and World War II, public, public trust of Britons in the United States was low, and it was because of uh, your view towards the war debts, you didn't think you should have to pay them, uh, you, that we should write those off and, and take it to be uh, your contribution to the war, to your own war, and uh, that really pissed off a lot of Americans. That did not uh, stop our helping your country in World War II. Now, we loaned a lot of money, so actually we did loan some money, and you did pay that back, you finished paying that back a few years ago, thank you, uh, we appreciate it. Uh, but in addition to that, you weren't only given equipment at cost. You were given equipment below cost. It was sold to you, but like uh, you know, between 10 and 15 cents on the dollar. Heavily discounted by the federal government when it was sold to you. Um, 
so that you know that that's a revenue stream that we could have made you know we could have made that revenue doing something else with that material but we sold it to you at a loss we are prepared to as i mentioned earlier give until it hurts for the united kingdom churchill recognized this about the united states and the the future of england the future of the uk that uh gone are the days of empire they're going away and that the future for your your great kingdom whatever it is going to be is in the largesse of the United States. Uh, that it would not be uh, wise for any any part any uh, government official in the UK to think that you can get away from the United States. You must keep those bonds because our future guarantees your own. Your future security at the time depended on our being our willing to step up and protect you. And we did it. And we did it quite well. You're welcome. Uh, no need to thank us. And he's right. You know, all, all of that happened. But you're not the sick man of Europe anymore. You're one of the largest economies in the world. You've got an extremely powerful military. I think it's like fourth or fifth on the planet. You're not chump change. You're not an unimportant, trivial little island that no one has to deal with. Even absent our fondness for the United Kingdom, you are a force to be reckoned with. And any country that is not prepared to accept that, that you are a major world economy, that you do have uh, an extremely powerful military, is delusional. And so you won't be treated that way because... As it turns out, when money's on the line, the thing that really makes the world go, go round, countries tend not to be delusional when they can when they can turn a profit. Even those those pesky Soviets were able to turn a profit back in the day. Uh, they understood the power of, of, of money. In any event, I, I it's hard to impress upon you the, the fondness that we currently hold for the United Kingdom. Uh, and since I can't do that, I, I would point to just when we were extremely cross with the United Kingdom, at, with Great Britain, and nevertheless, we gave through the nose to help you. Now, I, I realize that the bonds go in the other direction, but uh, the argument in, in the United Kingdom isn't about that you don't like us so much, it's that we don't like you quite all that much. And this is just complete nonsense. There's no country in the world we're willing to do more uh, for than the United Kingdom, uh, except for our own, of course. So in any event... Uh, we're not worried about the money. You can keep it for all I care. Uh, but the, the idea that when we're losing money by helping you, we're going to be extraordinarily generous. Uh, but when it comes to our making money off of you by trading with you, we're going to be like, <laughs> we're capitalists. Why would we engage in commerce that's going to you know, be that's going to turn a profit for us and for you? No, no, no. We're only going to be generous and like you when we lose money on you. This is this is not the view of, of how the American. This is not how the American mind works. I just uh, just take my word for it. That isn't. We're not that stupid. We have a lot of problems in this country. Uh, the inability to turn a dollar to turn a profit is not one of them. So putting that off to the side. Other things. Um, the EU and these ever closer political binds that you know solidarity, diversity, unity, blah blah blah, single currency. They'll talk about, well, you know, look at the, the economy we all admire. I heard this in one of the debates from one of the Remain camp, and she's European, with a fancy accent and everything, not British, but a fancy accent from, from the continent. And I was like, ooh, fancy accent. Let it glaze, let, you know, let it just daze and confuse me. And then I listened to what she said, and I said, ah, you're, you're lying to people. So you talk about the economy you most admire, a uh, single currency economy like the United States. We got that by abrogating the national sovereignty of all the states. You don't trade with the Republic of Vermont. There's no such thing as the Republic of Vermont anymore. It's the state of Vermont. It's national sovereignty abrogated. It's absorbed in the into the United States. To make it work, you have got to seriously wrestle with, as I mentioned in, in a previous video on this, with the issue of national sovereignty. And as I mentioned, it may well be worth your interest. It, it may well be worth the cost to forfeit your sovereignty for the, the goodie bag of promises that you've gotten about the future. I don't think it is, but you may think that trade-off uh, is worthwhile. We did it in the United States, but there are distinctions. The individual uh, nation-states here were weak after the war, and they were newly formed. The United Kingdom right now is not weak, and you've been around for a millennium. Uh, you're not a new kid on the block. You're not getting kicked around. You don't need to be scared for your safety. You can defend yourself. You have one of the world's most powerful militaries and us as your ally. And anyone or any group 
of people, all the rest of the countries in the world combined, uh, if they think that they're going to take the United Kingdom without their cities being left in rubble by my country, have another think coming. Your security is guaranteed by my country. We will be there with you through thick and thin, bombing and killing whoever needs to be bombed and killed to make sure that our, our, our well, distant relatives, quite literally, remain safe. We're in it for the long run. At the time, after, the, after our Revolutionary War, that was not the state of affairs here. Each of the individual nations was weak. Um, and they needed to do something about it. And, the, well, through the long and the short of it, is we got the United States out of it. But there are distinctions. We control the federal government. You don't have input into the EU. Every significant issue that the United Kingdom has brought to the EU, or, you know, fisheries, whatever it is, uh, you've lost. You don't have influence there. It's not democratically elected. Our federal government is. If we don't like what they do, we can get rid of them. And indeed, we do this every couple of years, although uh, for some reason we seem to like to re-elect incumbents. But that speaks to our stupidity, not, not a problem that is with the system. Your problems, uh, compounding to the stupidity of some of the voters, will be uh, the system in, into which you're being asked to go. You don't have control. You don't have direct influence. You can't throw out bad people and they fuck you over. Um, uh, other uh, issues on that front. It was openly debated. There was no doubt in anyone's mind that they would be forfeiting their national sovereignty to join the United States. Rogue Island and Republic of Vermont it, it's actually called Rhode Island, but it was called Rogue Island back in the day, because, you know, it's like, we're gonna, they were like the French, you know, fuck you, we'll do our own thing, Ugh, at the time. Anyway, um, it was open, it was openly debated, it, it was on bo uh, above board, on the up and up, everyone knew what was on offer and what it would cost. You are, are getting a back door into something like a federal states of Europe, but the distinction is, is it's not a democratic state. It would not be a democratic super state. It is an anti-democratic super state. And I'll give you, I'll, I'll, I'll try to point the, paint the distinction uh, this way. In the United States, we have public officials, just like any other country. And they have a pay scale. The president makes the most of political figures. Now, there are some federally owned corporations that have CEOs that make more than the president, but those are peculiars and they're not political institutions. Uh, so, back to the political front. The president makes more than any other uh, of such officials. And then below that you have the vice president, who makes a little over $200,000 a year. Uh, you have the Speaker of the House of Representatives, who makes a little over $200,000 a year. You have the Chief Justice of the United States and the Associate Justices of the Supreme Court of the United States, who make a little over $200,000 a year. Okay, a handful of officials who are paid at that level. And then you get cabinet secretaries who are just below that, and then so on down the executive schedule, as we call it here. Those are tightly controlled. They are specifically n uh, numbered by law. The exact number of those positions, the exact salary, it's publicly disclosed and it's debated in the Congress every couple of years what those salaries should be. The only constitutional restriction is, is that they cannot diminish the salary of any of the judges of the United States while they serve in office. Uh, they can hold it steady, or they can give them pay raises, but they can never diminish their salary. So that way our judiciary is fully independent and has no say in its own salary, unlike in the EU, where the judges of uh, some of the EU courts have decided that, indeed, they are owed a pay raise, and so they have ordered it, and uh, thus they got it. Anyway, putting it off to the side, uh, they're sitting, in the judge, sitting as judge in their own cause when their own finances are at stake, which is scandalous. That is corruption writ large. Anyway, so these, these positions are uh, exhaustively enumerated in federal law. There's an exact number of people who can executive schedule one, executive schedule two, you know, all the way down, and how they are put into office. Um, the pre you know, not, officers and inferior officers are either appointed by the president, if they're an officer of the United States, or if they're an inferior officer, they can be appointed uh, by and with the consent of the Senate by the president or by the heads of the departments, as is provided for by law. We know exactly how many of those people there are, and you can look at it, it's online, uh, their names are attached to their salary, there's no secret. You go to the EU, there are more than 10,000 such people in mid-level management whose salaries uh, only were discovered because it was leaked. It's not public knowledge. 
Now, if you think about that, the EU is larger than the United States, you know, five and you know, a half a billion people. But 10,000 such officials, you know, that, that are paid at the level of the Vice President of the United States, the Chief Justice of the United States, and the Speaker of the House of the Representatives of the Congress of the United States, it these people must be exceedingly important and have a great deal, a great deal of power and a lot to do to, uh, to be paid that kind of money. No, they don't. They're low-level functionaries and they get that because it's not a democratic institution. That kind of graft just does not last in, in a democratic institution where the people can, uh, can through an election or you know, through other means, by the way, constrain the government and, and uh, moderate its expenditures. Now, we have a lot of expenditure problems here in the United States, to be sure. But if you think that, that uh, capitalists like us in a democratic society have problems with uh, controlling our debt, you ain't seen nothing yet until the socialists get a hold of it, and the communists and the, the extreme, you know, the extreme uh, left wing. When they get a hold of that, uh, a, a, a well-placed communist uh, would make an American billionaire uh, jealous with how well they were treated. You know, it, it's 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 great work if you can get it. If you're one of the chosen few, uh, if you're one of the elites. So these are things that you need to think about very carefully. What kind of government do you want, and is it worth? forfeiting your sovereignty, a portion of your sovereignty at least, for an anti-democratic institution where you don't have any control over the officials and you have this kind of graft that goes on behind closed doors where their budget isn't audited. <clears throat> um, at least here we know we're getting fucked, <laughs> which I guess is sm small consolation. Anyway, um, for us, a couple of hundred years ago when we were weak, it was worth it to do it. You aren't in that position. You're not new. You're not weak. You're strong. You're powerful. You're established. You're well respected. Anyone who tells you that you're still the sick man of Europe, anyone who tells you that you're going to be treated like a redheaded stepchild on the world stage, is lying to you. They're misleading you, and they know that they're misleading you. And uh, anyone who anyone who dares tell the lie that the United States does not have a great deal of love for the United Kingdom and that we would not trade with you, or that we would give you particularly disadvantageous trading terms, uh, should be publicly flogged. Have a great day.